Grace and peace to you from God who loves you. Amen. I'm Kyle Johnson. I'm vicar at Grace Lutheran Church in Wilmington, Illinois. As so many communities of faith in the world have had to do, so have we done as well. Made the difficult decision to suspend in-person worship services for the time being due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I encourage you to avoid the term canceling church. As other faith leaders have said, there really is no such thing. We may forego formal worship and temporarily close buildings, but the church is the body of Christ on earth. The church is never canceled because the body of Christ does not sleep. Somewhere in the world right now, countless people are praying. Somewhere in the world right now, someone is sharing their faith with someone else. Somewhere in the world right now, people are following Jesus' call to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty. They are welcoming strangers, clothing the naked, tending to the sick, and visiting the incarcerated. As one author whose name escapes me has said, Worship is a training ground, preparing us to go out into the world in service of our neighbors. This is why we often refer to worship as a time where we are gathered, fed, and sent. Well, gathering is not an easy thing to do right now, but we may be fed through the many of the many ways worship is being re-envisioned during this remarkable time including watching worship services online or meditations such as the one you're reading now, or through taking special time, time set apart, to read your favorite or most comforting Bible passages or devotional material. One thing I've always encouraged, grab a glass of wine, turn off the phone, find a comfy chair, and read the Gospel of Mark all the way through in one sitting. If you've never done this, you've missed out. Today I would like you to join me in a time of devotion based on the ancient outline of worship still used in our worship services today. Gathering, word, meal, and sending. Unlike a regular worship service, I may stop at times to reflect on what's happening and give us things to think about. With that, I invite you to find a place within yourself to listen to that still small voice as we spend time worshiping in spirit with Christians around the globe. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is present, who gives life, who calls into existence the things that do not exist. Amen. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, and so we confess. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you, knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new hearts and right spirits, that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Amen. Receive God's good news. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. May God forgive us all of our sins in the name of Jesus who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for you. Amen. Let us pray. Bend your ear to our prayer, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. The psalm appointed for this day is an old favorite of so many Christians, Psalm 23, uh, a, a psalm that you might even know by heart. And it reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. I often find myself asking what if questions when it comes to scriptures. And a really big what if stands out for me with Psalm 23. Instead of reading through this text the way we've always done it, what if we use a voice, a voice of someone with complete confidence and unshakable faith in the words, basically reading as if the writer of this Psalm is declaring their public testimony. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through a valley that is as dark as the shadow of death itself, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a banquet table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The Gospel reading appointed for this day is John 9, 1 through 41. The Holy Gospel according to John, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed and now I see. 
Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they again said to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sin, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Full disclosure, this sermon is not 100% original to this Sunday. A couple of years ago, I took a class on preaching the Gospel of John. It was a remarkable class. I was assigned today's reading to write an exegesis paper and then a sermon that was given to the class. I've taken that sermon and I've rewritten it, cutting a bit here, adding a bit there, and I hope you'll be able to find something in it for you today. Author Tamsin Courtenay, and I hope I pronounced her name right, wrote a book that came out in 2018 chronicling her experience of living two months on the streets of London among the homeless. She followed and documented some 30 people 
including a businessman, a builder, a transsexual woman, a soldier, a child prostitute, an elderly couple, a battered wife, and others. The stories Courtenay shares are heartbreaking. She learned that it is, quote, a common sport for drunk club goers to urinate on sleeping homeless people, which means they have no usable bedding, no laughing matter in winter. She discovered that many, women included, are beaten and kicked until the assailant gives up the game. Courtney knows firsthand what that feels like to be seen as subhuman. She writes, in the early hours one morning I was sitting in a side street near Covent Garden with a guy I'd got to know and a group of his sleeping mates. Out of nowhere came a man in a suit, not a homeless man, reeking of booze and brandishing a piece of wood. He beat me down the right side of my body and legs so hard that I was deeply bruised for 10 days. It was over in seconds. The men I was with were not surprised. Courtenay shares the words of a woman named Charisse. Quote, a lot of people out here are vile. I've had people kick me, spit on me, pour alcohol on me and light a lighter. I've had it all, trust me. Courtenay titled her book, Four Feet Under. See, that's where the homeless live, on the ground, in the dirt, four feet lower than everyone else. I don't share this with you to induce the guilt that many of us feel when we are reminded of the reality of homelessness. I share this because I believe Courtney's words help us better understand the man born blind in John 9. I don't know exactly how the culture functioned at the time John wrote his gospel, but human nature is human nature. It is not a great leap to expect that the man born blind was treated exactly the same way as the people whose lives Courtenay describes, especially when he is treated with such disdain and dismissiveness by the leading Pharisees, as the reading tells us. The man born blind lived four feet under. Jesus comes across a beggar, blind from birth, reviled as a sinner. In this time and at this place, the disciples are probably asking a perfectly reasonable question in their minds. Commentators tell us that it was just assumed that some sin or another must have caused the man's blindness. But Jesus flips the conventional wisdom on its head. Neither the man nor his parents sinned, he told them. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Now, that last sentence is problematic, to say the least. I want to acknowledge that even if I don't explore it with you today. Now back to the scene and the drama. Jesus spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes. Again, this man born blind, probably a beggar, among the lowest in society, surely understood spit and dirt. Oh great, another person spitting on my face, another person rubbing dirt in my eyes. I didn't even say a word to him. Like Cherie said in Courtenay's book, I've had it all, trust me. But Jesus tells the man to wash away the spit and dirt in the pool called scent, which he does and suddenly he could see. Jesus gave the man the gift of sight, but there are clearly instances today where suffering is flipped on its head, and Jesus uses the spit and dirt of the world 
to open our eyes. Take, for example, a story that I acknowledge may make some of you uncomfortable hearing it in a sermon. I get it. It's about a young woman named Nadia Okamoto. At age 16, her family lost their house and they became homeless for a time. Okamoto says that while she was homeless, quote, I learned about an unaddressed need I'd never thought about before. Periods. So in 2014, she co-founded Period, a youth-run organization that provides care packages of menstrual products to homeless women, helping them feel cared for and dignified. Her organization promotes public dialogue around menstruation, regardless of how uncomfortable it makes people feel. In just these past six years, Period has distributed hundreds of thousands of period kits and now have over 600 registered campus chapters at universities and high schools in all 50 states and in 30 countries. Though she does not couch her experience in religious language, I believe Jesus used the dirt and spit of Okamoto's life, the painful homelessness that she experienced to help her and others really see. I've used the example of homelessness here mainly because I was profoundly moved by Tamson uh, Courtney's writing and I felt called to share it with you. But there are many, many forms of suffering we could consider. Problems faced every day by those we love and those we serve and by us. Everyone watching this video today. After all, there are reasons why support groups for victims of sexual assault exist. There are reasons why the Matthew Shepard Foundation exists. There are reasons why the Black Lives Matter exists. There are reasons why the social media campaign hashtag me too exists. And Jesus knows that pain. Both Mark and Matthew tell us the scribes and the elders and the soldiers spat on Jesus. Jesus tells us that in contrast to Jesus healing hands on the face of the man born blind, the soldier struck Jesus in the face. Then Jesus, by himself, according to John, dragged his own cross through the streets. Jesus knows what Charisse felt when she was spit on. Jesus knows what Courtney felt when she was beaten with a piece of wood. And Jesus knows our own sufferings in whatever forms they may come to us. Jesus dragged all those things, the abuse and the indignities and the pain, as well as our own sins, all of it, heaped on the cross, heaped on the cross, dragging them through the dirty streets with him to the place of the skull. Jesus takes on that spit and dirt so completely that he becomes the very mud himself. The mud spread on our eyes so that we may see him, see Jesus in those around us who are like the man born blind, in the people so heartbreakingly described in Courtenay's book, in everyone who lives four feet under everyone else. Jesus had heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus answered him, You have seen him, and he is the one speaking with you. You have seen him. 
What do you see? What do you see when you consider those moments in your life when Jesus washed away the spit and the dirt from your eyes, opening you to see, truly see those around you and you yourself? What do you see? Do you see someone like Jade? Another woman from Courtney's book. Jade's father gave her her first crack pipe when she was 10 years old. She became homeless at 15. Heroin use has damaged her arteries and her heart and she fears she is going to die soon. But Courtney wrote, an archaeologist could have taken a soft brush and gently dusted away the grime, the dirt, and the pain to reveal the radiant young woman that lay beneath it all. Jade said, Even though I've gone through this episode of going downhill, I will succeed. And I'm going to push myself. I'm going to work with disabled children or the elderly because my sister, she's disabled. And also because everyone slates to disabled people. But do you know what? They are fantastic, amazing, proper people. I'd never put disabled people down, ever. This is Jesus making mud from the spit and dirt of Jade's life, rubbing it on her eyes to make her see. And with the spit and dirt all around us, and in your own lives, Jesus is doing the same for you. Amen. Would you join me in the prayers of intercession, responding to hear us, O God, with your mercy is great. Turning our hearts to God who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of insight, Open the hearts of the church and the world to all who testify to your deeds of power. Raise up voices in your church that are often silenced or overlooked due to age, gender expression, race, disability, or economic status. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of insight, empower us to care for the land and all living things that dwell in it and beneath it. Provide rich soil for crops to grow. Bring rain to lands suffering drought. Protect hills and shorelines from damage caused by erosion. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of insight, bring peace to all people and nations. Anoint leaders who seek goodness, righteousness, and truth on behalf of all. Frustrate the efforts of those who would seek to cause violence or terror. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of insight, you care for our needs even before we ask. Come quickly to all who seek prayer this day. Accomplish healing through the work of doctors, nurses, physical therapists, nutritionists, and all who tend to human bodies. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of insight, help this assembly gathered online lift up the unique gifts of each person who enters virtually or physically, no matter their physical cap capacity, cognitive ability, or sensory need. Help us to be creative and brave in making our facilities and our ministries accessible to all. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of insight, you call out to those who are asleep and awaken them to new life with you. We give thanks for your saints. Join us together with them as your children in this world and in the next. Hear us, O God, 
Your mercy is great. People of God, for what else would we pray? Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, as we commend them to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Now the third part of our liturgy begins with the collection of an offering which is brought forward to the altar along with the bread and wine that will be used for communion. Obviously we cannot do this at this very moment, but in thanksgiving to all who continue to sustain the church's mission with your tithes and offerings and who give so much to our communities in other ways, I offer up this offering prayer. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our times, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Foregoing the Eucharist today, I would end our time together with a blessing and dismissal. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Holy God, speaking, spoken, and inspiring, bless you, unbind you, and send you in love and in peace. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.